Step four, boundary conditions two. Now we're going to uh, continue with the derivation of a boundary conditions. And is, in particular, we are going to look at Maxwell's third equation. So here it is. The scenario is still the same. We've got our uh, electromagnetic radiation coming from dielectric one and traveling into dielectric uh, two. But this time, we're going to see what happens if we demand that the following condition is satisfied. In other words, when Maxwell's third equation holds. Maxwell's third equation tells us about the line integral of the electric field uh, over a closed loop and how it's related to the negative of the uh, change uh, with time of the magnetic flux through the surface enclosed by this loop. So, since we are talking about line integrals, the appropriate thing to do now is to draw a loop. Again, it would work for any, any loop that you want to draw, any closed loop, but we're going to make things simple and we're going to consider this rectangular loop. We're going to walk around this loop in this following direction and we are going to sum all the contributions of the electric uh, field components and see what we get. So, first we are going to consider the contributions from this path over here and this path over here, so only the green parts. And you can see that if you try to evaluate the dot product between uh, this line segment and E, you are only going to get contribution from E V1 because that's in the direction of our line segment. E H1 is not going to have any contribution whatsoever. On the other hand, if you walk down here, this uh, part of our gr uh, green uh, line segment, you're also only going to get a contribution for, uh, from E V1 and not E H1. But now the line segment is in the opposite direction to our previous case. Therefore, the contributions from the line segments over here and here are going to cancel. Same thing will happen if we look at the, uh, these parts of our loop in the dielectric 2. Again, E H2 is perpendicular to our line segments, therefore it doesn't contribute to the integral and the two values that we get for this path and this path are going to be same in magnitude but opposite in sign, therefore they will cancel. The only contributions that are going to enter into our line integral are these uh, parts at the top. This blue part over here in dielectric 1 and this blue part going in the opposite direction in dielectric 2. So we can write the following. E H1, that's the only field component contributing to the line integral because it's in the direction of the line segment, times L, that's the length of our line segment, minus E H2 times L. The reason why there is a minus is the same as we saw in the previous step for the surface integrals. Now the line segment is in the opposite direction, therefore we must introduce a minus. And this difference is equal to negative d of phi b uh, over dt, the time change in the magnetic flux. But, again, what we can do is use the following trick. We can take our loop and shrink its size. So we can shrink the height, this height of the loop, to zero. So all we are going to left is the contribution from this part and this part but that's just a line, it's not a surface. Therefore, the surface integral of the change of the magnet flux is going to be zero. And if that is zero, we can simply uh, um, divide by L, and what we get is our second boundary condition for the horizontal components of the electric field. Namely, we get that E H1 is equal to E H2. So we saw previously that as uh, light radiation goes from dielectric 1 into dielectric 2, the vertical components change depending on the coefficients Ke1 and Ke2. On the other hand, we have just arrived from Maxwell's third uh, equation that the horizontal components of the field do not change, they remain the same. Now we can do the exact same thing for magnetic field. I'm not going to go in detail through the calculations because they're exactly the same with only minor differences. Again, 
the trick that we are going to use to evaluate this surface integral is to consider a cylinder where the top half is sitting in dielectric 1 and the bottom half is sitting in dielectric 2. And we shrink the height of the cylinder to obtain just a simple uh, circular surface through which we evaluate the magnetic flux. But previously for um, the electric field, we had a finite right-hand side. And we know that there is no such thing, at least in classical electrodynamics, as magnetic monopoles. Therefore, the right-hand side is equal to zero. So the boundary conditions for the vertical component of the magnetic field is very simple. BV1 is equal to BV2. In other words, the vertical component of magnetic field does not change as the electromagnetic wave travels from dielectric 1 into dielectric 2. Finally, all we have to do is consider Maxwell's fourth equation. And again, because we are talking about a line integral, uh, a closed line integral, what we do, we use the same trick. We draw a rectangular loop where the top half is sitting in dielectric 1, bottom half is sitting in dielectric 2, and we shrink its height. And what we get is the following, that the horizontal components of the magnetic field of the electromagnetic wave as it travels from dielectric 1 to dielectric 2 does not change. So let's summarize and write all four boundary conditions on one slide. We see that the only boundary condition that produces some change is the top one for the vertical component of the electric field. In other words, as our uh, electromagnetic wave travels, the length of this vector changes and the change is given by the ratio of Ke1 and Ke2. All of the other components, Eh1, Bv1, uh, Bv, uh, Bh1, and so on, also for the dielectric 2, do not change. So really, we get an image like this. The, this, this component, Eh1, is the same as Eh2. Same for the magnetic field components. The only thing that changes is Ev1, compared to EV2.